Company um, for the Advanced GI Fellowship. This meeting is being recorded. And today we have our second um, Grand Rounds presentation of this academic year. Um, so without further ado, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Kuhnsler and Dr. Hakopian for being so graciously willing to participate in this. Um, and I'd just like to introduce Dr. Hagopian. She is our moderator today. Um, she is formerly uh, from my neck of the woods currently in New Jersey, but just started uh, her new position in Ohio. She's the Assistant Dean for Clinical Education and Associate Professor in the Departments of Medical Education and Surgery at University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences. So thank you so much, Dr. Hagopian, for um, being with us today, and I look forward to hearing your insightful wisdom. Thank you Dr. so much for the invitation, Dr. Benzi and Dr. Jiraja. Excellent. Okay. The floor is yours, Dr. Kunzler. All right. It's a great honor to, to present these great, great rounds, and uh, I really appreciate all the help I have from my mentor, who is Dr. Husband, and I really appreciate uh, being able to do the fellowship here at Miami Cancer Institute, where I learn all the time, um, like nonstop. Um, so basically, I'll do a presentation on, on new adjuvant chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer. I'll present three cases, which I'm gonna go through them briefly, and then basically look at the, at, at, at the literature regarding this. Let me see if I can pass first slide. Yeah, so first to mention pancreatic cancer is, um, is a, a disease with very um, limited prognosis. Um, so 3% of all the new cancer cases are actually pancreatic cancer, but the mortality uh, accounted for pancreatic cancer is actually 8%. If you see, it's the least one in the list of, of cases, but it's the third one in the list of mortality. And we have made advancements in uh, chemotherapeutic regimens to try and prove survival. So this is um, a trial comparing um, uh, multi-regiment chemotherapy uh, with fulfirinox versus monotherapy with gencitabine, show improved survival. Um, but this still has not uh, led to a great impact in overall mortality. So five-year survival rate of pancreatic cancer is still around 11%. If we correct this graph to, to bring it, these are, this is information from Sears. If we correct this graphic to bring it to 100% bar, you basically see that the survival is still uh, very limited. Um, I'll do a quick overview just about the staging because this is going to be important for us in the presentation. Uh, pancreatic cancer is basically uh, that worked up with, with imaging. So some centers do CT, some centers do MRIs. It's important that after we have, um, after we have the disease identified is to look for disease elsewhere. This can usually be done with a chest CT and sometimes MRI or PET scan to assess uh, liver metastasis. It's also extremely important to see the relationship between the, the tumor and the vessels uh, to classify them as upfront resectable, borderline resectable or locally advanced. Uh, classification of resectability is, is not extremely uh, hard. It's actually very straightforward. So basically, um, classification as locally advanced is based on arterial involvement and unreconstructability of SMB and portal vein. So whenever you have a major artery that's uh, uh, um, contacted for greater than 180 degrees, namely SMA or, or celiac trunk, that's locally advanced. And upfront resectable, many people um, actually confuse this, but if you have vascular involvement that's venous, that's less than 180 degrees, this is actually considered upfront resectable and borderline resectable, all the other cases in the center. The term locally advanced, you all know, was changed from, um, from um, unresectable a few years ago. So I'll present the first case briefly. This is a patient that came with painless jaundice and a CA99 of 100. And in the Admission MRI, we basically see a pancreas that's very white. That's the normal appearance of pancreas without contrast. And we see this motion is here that's gray in the head of the pancreas. 
the portal vein, which is running here, is touched by this tumor well over 180 degrees here. So this tumor, um, let me pass this slide. So this patient was biopsied and was uh, diagnosed with a poorly different adenocarcinoma. Tumor board uh, recommendation was to start new adjuvant chemotherapy with fulfirinox, which tolerated well until the 12th cycle. This was classified as borderline resectable. And then we have the follow-up scan after the 12 cycles of chemotherapy. This again, the pancreas uptake. This is the arterial phase. So the pancreas is uptaking some contrast, not too much. And the lesion is this gray area here. That's our lesion, which has decreased in size, but it's still there. And that's the portal vein. So lesion touch portal vein around basically still 180 degrees. So we proceeded again to um, rediscuss the case in tumor board. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if uh, the audience wants to chime in. So we have a, we have a 59 year old who you're classifying him as a borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. The definition of borderline resectable is resting in the contact of the tumor to the portal vein. And you've given him now 12 cycles of systemic chemotherapy and you have seen regression in the tumor, correct? Correct. So my question to the my question to the audience, um, and as in particular, um, I, I, I want to do a shout out to some of the fellows who are out there. Um, it, do we need to see what are we looking for on these on follow up imaging on the, for this patient? Are we looking for regression, or what exactly are we looking for? I can start calling out on names from fellows. I don't know if you're here. Um, if, if we saw, I mean, if we saw progression of disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that would be a poor prognostic sign, and that might be someone you might consider not going forward with surgery. If, okay. If Thank you. Great. So you're looking for lack of progression of disease, right, Dr. McDowell? Yep. Okay. All right, good. I want to make that point because many times when we look at these cases, especially with our oncology colleagues, they they are they are looking for regression. We're not necessarily looking for regression. We're looking for progression that's going to stop us from going to the operating room. Progression of disease or metastatic disease. I just want to I just want to make that point to the fellows. Great. Continue, please. Yes, then we rediscussed the case in tumor board to see if we should do some uh, local uh, treatment or not. And uh, the CA99 had already dropped to 9.6, only with the fulfirinox. And uh, the decision was made to give the patient uh, radiation through MRLinic. So MRLinic is uh, radiation targeted with real-time MRI um, the advantage of MR Linux is that you can deliver ablative doses in a short period of time and very, very precisely. And patients tend to have very few side effects. So this patient received a 40 gray in five fractions. Then we re-imaged the patient four weeks after. And let me just pause this. And this image, unfortunately, there was some motion artifact, um, but we can see this now is the area of the tumor. So the normal pancreas is white. This gray area here, that's the, the tumor. And this is the SMB. So there's still some contact with the SMB. Then we decided to, to proceed with surgery. So this patient was taken to a laparoscopic um, um, Whipple, but was, the case was converted to open just because of lack of uh, progression. 
she did really well. She was discharging postoperative day eight. Um, and the pathology after the fulfirinox and, and the Marlinga showed complete res, almost complete response with uh, this was scored as one minimal residual foci of, of tumor, no lymphovest, no perineal invasion, and zero positive uh, uh, lymph nodes out of 14. Her CA19, 91 month after um, surgery was 4.4. So um, Dr. Kunzler, we have a question in the chat mm -hmm. uh, from Dr. Hassan. Um, asking if the C8199 does not drop, would that change treatment plan? So what is, uh, would you like to take that question and then we can open it up to the, to the audience? Yeah, I, th I think if the C8199 had increased, that's not a good sign because we had a C8199 before surgery, before treatment that was 100. So if you had increased with Fulfirinox, We'll probably be, I uh, think, looking at increased uh, tumor burden. I don't think we would have done uh, radiotherapy. We would probably just follow the patient more. Yeah. Um, so I know Dr. J. Raja has two questions, but I'm going to ask Dr. J. Raja his thoughts on the CA199 and um, borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. And what, do, what does the follow up? How do you approach the CA-199 in these patients? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Ogopian. I think this is a really tough question, and I'd love to see what Horacio thinks and Sharona also. Um, I personally am looking for at least a halving of the CA-199, understanding that really a CA-199 with the patient jaundiced or cholangitic is not a reliable measure. So it would need to be a stented or a decompressed CA-199 for comparison. Um, I would ideally like to see it in the normal range to feel really good about surgery. Um, I, I did want, may I ask my questions now or do you want to complete this topic, Dr. Hagopian? Well, yeah, let's just let's just finish this one question. Uh, thank you for pointing out to me that we have other faculty here who I can call on Dr. Dr. Asteban. What What is your approach to, or how do you interpret the CA-199 in these, uh, in these cases? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hagopian, and thank you, Dr. Jayaraja. Um, just for clarification, we have two Dr. Asbans on the call, um, uh, Dominic, Dominic and myself. And uh, and uh, Dominic is uh, now the associate program director. Then uh, um, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm going to take the prerogative that the question was for me, just because you and I know each other before. <laughs> and, uh, and then then we'll, we'll ask what Dominic um, what Dominic feels. But uh, my my approach is usually at least fifty percent drop on on the CA99. If the CA99 has not dropped fifty percent at least 50%, then it's a no-no. And then of course, there's always gray zone, right? What about if it is 40%, then you have to, to put all together about patient um, baseline uh, situation, how the, the tumor is gonna be, if somebody drops 40% and the, the tumor has not responded well, or the patient is very frail, uh, frail then uh, probably I would lean towards just not doing surgery, but if I'm, um, if on the contrary, it's a strong patient is young, then you go for it. But uh, to me, 50% is the cutoff. Um, Dominic, Dr. Asman, what do you think? Thank you, Dr. Asman. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think um, having a, a set cutoff is important because it, it, a, it helps guide discussion you know, at the multidisciplinary tumor board meetings, but also with the patient. Um, but I think uh, we have a lot of situations where sometimes we, it doesn't drop as much as we want it to, uh, but the patients uh, were very motivated for surgery. They've done very well with their chemotherapy otherwise. And we may obviously, you know, uh, elect to operate anyway, understanding they're at a higher risk for uh, recurrence um, locally or especially at a, at a distant site. Um, or in the, in the other situation where sometimes it, it does drop a, a decent amount, but you see the patient not doing well. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, um, uh, how much are they, are they going to benefit from resection in general? But but it's it's definitely helpful. And as we all know, it's, it's an important prognostic factor. So having having guidelines are I think have been very important for our practice. Great, fantastic. Well, let me in the interest of time, let me move to uh, Dr. J. Raja. you had two questions and then Dr. Ray ha also has a question. 
Uh, Dr. Kunz, the two questions. One is I love the fact that you all are using MRI because Dr. Asman knows that the data from uh, from Germany, I believe, detected like 20% of METs if you've used diffusion-weighted MR. So it's great that you all are using that. It's very difficult for surgeons to use MR because they don't know how to read it. So I love that you are spending time doing that and, and kudos to you because all the information is there on the MR. That's the issue. Okay. We just need to know how to read it. The second question for you is how do you stratify um, basically an SBRT modality of radiation compared to say um, uh, protons? Because you can deliver you know, quite a bit of dosing with no exit dose in protons with protons. And I'm just wondering, again, it's, not, it's a big discussion, but just you all favor MR-based uh, uh, radiation. Is that right? Basically SBRT? I'm sure I have very no, uh, little knowledge about proton therapy. Okay, but maybe I can I can I can respond to that. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Filippi, for for being transparent. Um, the, we have used proton in the past. Our facility here is one of the best facilities in the country under one roof for radiation oncology. We have every single type of radiology that I know of, and we do have proton too. But MR Linac has worked very well because they do it under live. Then when you see the target moving out of the field, the machine automatically stops. And when the, tar when the lesion goes into target, the machine fires. Um, and also, this, since it's done every day under MRI, there's no fiduciaries that are put like on a CT. And many times you see that the intestines move from one day to the next, and you alter the treatment according to that. Then we're very fortunate to have that. And we have seen a significant change on patients, particularly the unresectable. We have several cases that are alive three years later with that type of, uh, of approach. Very nice. And if I may add, we usually we do as standard SBRT here for cases of local advanced with extensive tumor bird, very big tumors. Those cases we don't do uh, MR linic. I see. Wonderful, fantastic. And then, Doctor, thank thank you both. Um, and Doctor Ray, um, you, Doctor Curtis Ray, you had a question. I, I did have a question. So. You know, recently there was this uh, Alliance trial published in JAMA Oncology where they looked at randomizing patients with borderline resectable pancreas cancer to, you know, fulfirinox versus fulfirinox with radiation. And once again, we have another clinical trial showing radiation does not show a survival advantage. If anything, it was less. Um, and I think you know, there's a lot of talk here, aren't even so far in this case about radiation. And I would say, you know, how many more studies do we need to do to show that radiation doesn't improve survival for pancreas cancer and continue doing it? I know it's a controversial question, but yeah, you know, show show me a clinical trial that has radiation improving survival. So I thank you so much for bringing up that question. I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna ask Dr. Ross. I think that Dr. Sharona Ross is on the line. Um, uh, Dr. Ross, what, what are your thoughts about uh, radiation, the addition of radi radiation in um, borderline resectable pancreatic cancer? So the only time that I would actually suggest radiation is after the, like in this situation where the, there's 12 cycles of fulfirinox, it still seemed to be uh, involved. Then I would try the radiation and following that, usually I would proceed with EUS and FNA of the same area surrounding the major blood vessels to see if they still come back positive. If they, and I've done it before now for the past uh, just over two years, where if the EUS FNA were negative of the same areas that used to be positive, um, I would take them to surgery. And so uh, if there was no radiation before, I don't feel necessary to, to get the radiation, but many times I'm not even involved with that decision to uh, get the, uh, the patient on radiation. It makes the operation somewhat more difficult, but I must say after all those locally advanced cases, um, the patients that received the chemo and sometimes with radiation after a year, a year and a half, I get all negative uh, margins 
uh, despite the CT scan that showed the haziness and still the involvement around the vessels, I was still able to get negative uh, margins because it turns, it seems to have turned all to fibrosis and scarring rather than retain cancer. And the cancer itself, like in this case, is very small uh, on the final pathology. Yeah, Dr. Hagok, and if I can add a little bit, I mean, I, thank you, Dr. Ross, and, and that's our approach. We normally don't use routine uh, radiation. Interestingly, today, several of the cases do have radiation, but are usually the cases that we don't see a significant progression with chemo. Now, or Dr. Ray, um, I agree with you. I, I was almost against radiation until I came to this institution. And little by little, I have seen results that I'm quite surprised. And yes, you will have a study. There's a prospective randomized trial with MR Linac that is, uh, that is finished and it was submitted for publication. It's called the SMART trial. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not a, a privileged to review the results, but, uh, but you will see that coming out into the literature. It is prospective randomized. Now, I'm not going to say that one prospective randomized is going to erase all the other ones, but I am intrigued by this new um, approach with MR Linux that I have seen at this institution. I wanted to mention also that I think um, it's it's a very interesting question because I think a lot of us have kind of discarded uh, radiation as being beneficial, but it seems that some of the more longitudinal data, like the um, long-term outcomes after the Preopang uh, trial, the Dutch trial, did show some overall survival um, to patients getting radiation. So I think it's it's an interesting question where as uh, our technology gets better, as the chemotherapy that's giving that's given neoadjuvant um, not only you know has gotten better over the past decade, uh, but also is given more frequently, which I think is a separate topic of discussion. Um, I think it's an interesting question to kind of look out for, you know, whether or not we're going to reevaluate the use of of uh, radiation neoadjuvant in a neoadjuvant setting. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been a really fantastic discussion. Um, in the interest of time, um, I want Dr. Kunzler to continue with his uh, with his presentation. Thank you. Okay, I'll present a second case now. It's uh, similar to the first one. Um, a 78, 71 year old male presented with painless jaundice, C99 of 400 and 544. The tumor in this patient was was more impressive than the other one. So this is uh, arterial phase of, of an MRI. And if you come down here, you see this bile duct dilated, pancreatic duct dilated. Mm -hmm. As we come down, down, down towards the feet, down, you see that the ducts are basically going to disappear and you start seeing this mass here, this big mass that abuts and almost encases the first regional branch and, and abuts the SMV and keeps, keeps coming down almost all the way to D3 in the duodenum. So this patient also was um, started on new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. We did 12 cycles. Do you want to stop now or, or can I continue? Keep going. It's basically the same. Uh, but And here you can see the tumor response. So after, just pause this, this one second. So this is our SMV here. And this is our tumor here, this gray area here mm -hmm. is our tumor. So it still abuts vessels, abuts the first regional branch. Um, so again, we were intrigued about doing uh, surgery or, or doing um, radiation. We came back to tumor board, C199 that was over 500 now, it's 16. We do the same protocol with MR Linux, 40 centigrade. And the image after the, the, the radiation show a markedly decrease in size of the tumor. So the tumor now is this area here with central necrosis and this peripheral enhancement here. That's the bile duct. We proceed um, to surgery. We do an open um, uh, Whipple pylorus preserving uh, pancreatic anectomy and we had to take part of the SMV and portal vein basically part that part where the first regional branch was was um, entering the vein we had to reconstruct it with a bovine patch we we're actually able to preserve that the first regional branch patient did well also uh, and we had 
uh, a score to uh, tumor response with uh, evident tumor regression. Unfortunately, this patient had per perinary invasion, but lymph nodes were uh, zero, positive out of 15, and his CA199, 30 days post-op was seven. Um, may I go to the next case then? Uh, sure, does anybody have any questions about that case? We asked a lot of questions on the first case. Yes, it's basically the same. Uh, a lot of the same issues, but yes. yes. No, this, um, this, it, this, you know, maybe maybe um, if Dr. Asaban, oh, Dr. J. Raja, please. So I, I wanted to ask a philosophical question, and maybe uh, Dr. De La Fuente, if you're on, uh, if you could take this one. My question is, if you have impingement of the portal vein SMV confluence and you shrink away enough that uh, you may not need to do a vascular dissection or a resection, technically, is it your practice to routinely do that just based on, as the radiation oncologists call it, pretreatment volume of disease, number one? My second question is if you have not treated that patient with radiation pre-op and you call them borderline resectable and you resect them and get an R naught resection, understanding that the reason you treated them neoadjuvantly was because you were anticipating an R1 dissection, do you treat those patients adjuvantly with radiation therapy? Dr. De La Fuente, are you able to take one or both of those questions? Yeah, happy, happy to give my uh, my take on this. Uh, you know, I usually don't use any radiation for borderline resectable. I only use it for locally advanced because I think that's a completely different uh, animal. Um, I'm surprised, happily surprised, uh, I have to say, that these patients actually can tolerate 12, 12 cycles of referinos. Uh Here in Orlando, uh, my medical oncologists are very worried about neuropathy, and it's not uncommon for them to either modify the Purpurinox regimen or even switch it over, um, although Gensadabin is also known to give neuropathy. So I think that's the key to these uh, responses that you're seeing, the, the fact that patients are tolerating 12 cycles of chemo, of Purpurinox. The second part of the question is, I think it's very important, and this is something that we teach our residents and fellows, the need for a vascular reconstruction is pretty much determined by the presentation CAT scan or MRI. Um, no one is expecting to see shrinkage of the tumor to the point that you're going to have to change the surgical approach. In fact, um, I almost always prep the groins and I'm ready to reconstruct the portal vein or the SMB uh, in someone that has a borderline resectable at the beginning because I think they will need a vascular reconstruction almost always. Um, so, so that's my take on things. I typically don't use radiation therapy for borderline resectable. And I'm, I'm happily surprised and, and I congratulate uh, Horacio and Dominic, uh, about the fact that they're able to do 12 cycles of free enough. I, I, that's really impressive. And Dr. Berman, would you comment on the adjuvant radiation in patients that have undergone resection for borderline resectable uh, pancreatic cancer without preoperative radiation? Yeah, so I think in an R1 resection, uh, we would typically refer those patients for postoperative radiation. Um, I want to piggyback on the last comment, though. Um, we, as I'm sure many of your centers are accruing to the Alliance trial looking at perioperative chemotherapy, um, and uh, we have had a problem. We've had some, we've had dropouts for two reasons. One, the CA199 goes up while they're receiving fulfirinox, and secondly, because of intolerance to the regime, which is eight cycles preoperatively and four cycles postoperatively, uh, just like the, the prior discussant mentioned. So um, I, I, again, clinically, we've had difficulty with getting uh, patients to that many cycles of falfirinox. And um, uh, I think that, that's, a, that's a balance I think we'll need to dance with uh, going forward. But uh, there's no question as benefit. The question is, can they tolerate that much uh, falfirinox? Thank you. But just, just to be clear, Dr. Bowman, if you have an anticipated R1 as your reason for neoadjuvant, is there, or, I mean, I understand the question of neoadjuvant and resectable lesions is a topic for another discussion, but if you've got an anticipated R1 that you then 
get an R naught on post neoadjuvant, but expect an R1 based on initial imaging, would you treat that patient? No. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. J. Raja, for those couple of questions. To stimulate more discussion, the the fun part about the these these conferences are not only the cases, but then also the interaction that we we get with the fellows and the faculty. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Kunzler. Okay, so I'll present a third case. This this case is a little controversial. Um, so this is a 50 year old year old male that presented with abdominal pain and jaundice and had a bilirubin that was not very high. He had 10 pound weight loss in a C99 of 377. So when we proceed with the images on this patient, um, we are caught by surprise. So I'm gonna show you the, the image of the pancreas first. So this is arterial face, pancreas is very white. The tumor is this dark area here, this dilated pancreatic duct basically. Uh, it's the splenic artery is, is far from, from the tumor. So if you come here, let me just see if I can pause it in the correct, in the good slide. If you come here, you see that you have almost one centimeter of, of splenic artery here spared and celiac trunk spared, SMA is spared, the portal vein is spared is on the other side. But now when we take a look at the liver, we see this here. Can you guys see it? So this is a metastasis in segment three, very suspicious. Um, now he had jaundice, so we proceeded with um, within the RCP to find the reason of the jaundice was biliary sludge. And at the same time, US confirmed uh, adenocarcinoma of the body of the pancreas. So we took him to a cholecystectomy because of the biliary sludge. And we did a, a, a resection of that lesion in segment three and what it was metastatic adenocarcinoma. Now, this guy is 50 years old. We do 12 cycles of fulfurin ox, CA199 has come down to 14, normal. You wanna pause a little here, uh, Dr. Hagop? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Thank you for this case. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that we, we left this one for last and we've got a lot of time for discussion. So thoughts from the, from the group, um, you know, how would you approach this? You have a 50 year old gentleman with a body of pancreas adenocarcinoma. He had one single metastasis um, to the liver that was removed. I assume that the rest of his rest of his metastatic workup was negative and you did an intraoperative ultrasound right. at the time of laparoscopy and documented no other lesions. Right. Um, and now he is 12 at post 12 cycles, uh, chemo and his CA 199 is dropped to 14. All right. Further and management. Completely normal now. Mm -hmm. And the tumor shrunk in size a little. I'd like to hear maybe from the from some of the fellows. Um, any fellows out there that want to weigh in? What are your thoughts um, and about this case, and what would be the approach at your center? And I'm just going to help. Uh, I don't know yep. that we have. Um, uh, if there are any fellows on, please jump on. Dr. Benzi, do you know anyone off the top of your head? Sure, Dr. Butano, do you mind um, giving us a weigh in on what you think Dr. Ross would uh, do with this case? Sure, happy to. Uh, I think in this particular case, sorry, I'm trying to, my video is not working. In this particular case, uh, she would probably not elect for the cholecystectomy. She would probably get an interventional radiology to biopsy the liver lesion. Um, and as for the fulfirinox, he's, I believe, 50, or is that what they said? And so definitely undergo several uh, cycles of fulfirinox and then uh, reassess with a repeat uh, study of some kind.
I'm sorry, I had to drop off for just like a moment. And uh, so Dr. J. Raj, I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, over for me for a moment. Sorry. Yeah, sure. So actually, Dr. Nilon, you're on. This is really nice to hear from you, a pancreas expert. This is a patient with known metastatic lesion to the liver that was resected, has now responded beautifully, has a clearly resectable body cancer. 50 years old, emotional heartstrings are being pulled. Yes, uh, thanks, and wonderful to see everyone. Uh, uh, Horatio, it's so nice to see that you have your father here with you. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, th I think that we've all, any of us who have some miles on us, and I certainly have my share, have done, uh, have resected a small met at the same time as our resection, and, and have had several years of, re of recovery and, and, and disease-free periods, even before Fulpirinox. If I think there's a, something that I hope gets said today, it's just that the, uh, you know, we keep talking about waiting for uh, imaging changes when the breakthrough uh, uh, concept in first borderline resectable and then locally advanced was the fact that you won't see any imaging changes at all. And that for most surgeons is news. And, you know, not, I, I tell my patients, there doesn't need to be one of me at every hospital, but if you're in a, uh, if, you, if you're in all of those other hospitals where there are no experts, even if they get full fear knocks, they'll look at those x-rays and they'll say, I'm not operating on you. There's never nothing to be done. So I've been trying to do my share of giving talks, and I hope we all do that, to just tell uh, other surgeons that the world has changed and that these people are not unresectable necessarily. And we all know there are some are, are complete pathologic responses. So the, the waiting for imaging changes is over. I think Sharona's idea, hi Sharona, is very ingenious of doing another EUS. I haven't seen that written before. I do know that things like uh, PET CT and, the, and now new, this is sort of uh, PET MRI, you know, we're looking for something else to give us better news on what we're gonna do with uh, these imaging that doesn't change. And we know that they may still end up with favorable pathology in spite of no changes. Uh, and, you know, I think we all know that aggressively going after arteries is a bigger deal than going after veins. And so I think all of us are coming up with our own cookbook, cookbook re uh, recipe for what to do about those kinds of advanced patients. But the big news is we have some of these patients where their actual tumor burden may not be great. Yes, thank you so much for that. Other thoughts from, uh, from the group? Just, just to say that if we're going to be doing this, it needs to be in very selected patients, right? And it is much easier decision when it is a distal vancatectomy than when it is a Whipple. Then um, on this case, it was not that difficult of a decision um, uh, given the minimum invasive approach now for distals and um, extended lefts or whatever we're going to call them. Um, I think that the, the impact on the patient's quality of life is, is much less and uh, I feel that um, we should be a little bit more liberal when we have patients that have had that response like this one. Our, Again, very selectively. I'm, right. I'm gonna just say for me, Dr. Hagopian, I, if it's metastatic, it's metastatic. I'm not operating on them ever. Um, I always try to do something and then I'm always really disappointed about three to six months post-op when they show up with other leash lesions. So as opposed to colorectal, for example, I, um, I uh, obviously for colorectal cancer, we would do, you know, major hepatectomy if it makes sense. But in this uh, disease, I personally don't. Sorry. I, yes. I agree completely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that I, I think there are a couple of things here. Um, once it's metastatic, it is metastatic. I don't disagree with you, Dr. J. Raja. But I do think that this is all about tumor biology, right? And so we have a patient who, I mean, and, and we all have done distal pangs or pancreatic odontectomies on patients who look like they have clearly resectable disease and six months later they have metastasis. We've all had that experience and we've all had the experience of, of, of the, the opposite. Right. So, so I think that what this is all about is really 
tumor biology and it's and it's patient selection exactly what dr h Esteban said um and that is this is if we were to recommend moving forward with surgery for this patient that's because this patient had you know looks like he had um an extremely good response it's a more straightforward operation, right? As opposed to a pancreatic duodenectomy, and you have a young patient. He's relatively young. So putting all those things together, you know, it's, I'm not sure that it's completely unreasonable. Of course, it always starts with the patient and having that discussion with the patient. Um, so I think that both, both points are very well taken. Um, and I think, I think potentially justifiable, um, thought tumor genetics and patient genetics have any impact on these decisions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open that question up to the, to the, um, the audience folks. So I think Dr. Rabkin made a comment. So maybe you can, uh, uh weigh in on that. Dr. Rabkin. Uh, my my comment really is just that these the when, whenever we're extending our treatments, it's really important to be doing it in a study environment. Talking to the patient, of course, is important, but patients don't have the ability to really understand the intricacies. And I think it's a little misleading to expect that a patient is going to say, yes, let's go for surgery, no, go for surgery, uh, although that's clearly their option. I think it's really important if we give them the offer of intervening with surgery, even for a distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, minimally invasively, I think it really has to be done in a clinical trial environment. Well, I'm not sure if in a clinical trial, but definitely in, in a study um, uh, or either maintaining a retrospective, I mean, a prospective database in that way you can sit down and analyze. And that's what we did at Mayo. Um, after several years of being very selective on this, we went back and reviewed our results on those young patients, exactly as Dr. Hagopian has said. Um, we wrote it up and realized that there is merit in doing in very selected patients. The question is, what do you call selected? Because you cannot open up. And there's also a publication from uh, Heidelberg, from Buchler, um, that, that uh, justifies doing this, maybe a little bit more aggressive than what I would do, but... Uh, but there are ways of doing this under a study that doesn't necessarily has to be prospective randomized because the reality is the endpoints for these studies are gonna be extremely difficult. The patients are very difficult to compare. Then um, I do feel that anybody doing pancreatic surgery should follow their outcomes. If not, if that should be standard of care. And I think the surgical organizations, HPBA should, should force us and pancreas club should, should not force us, but should, strongly encourage for anybody doing pinker surgery to follow your own results and analyze it every so often. Completely agree. It should be IRB. Yes. Wanted to um, mention, you know, going back a little bit to just the, the basis of, of uh, the presentation for this case. And there was an interesting um, uh, session on this actually at, at IHPBA of, uh, you know, surgery with oligometastatic pancreatic uh, cancer. Um, the the same way usually when we discuss tumor biology and the patient's functional status, et cetera, I think it's in the setting of patients who may have been offered a surgery um, or more aggressive treatment, but because the tumor biology did not prove to, to do very well, because the patient's functional status wasn't wasn't optimal, then we decide to to maybe scale back the uh, the interventions. Um, this, in some ways, uh, highlights the, the sort of the opposite case where the tumor biology and and their functional status, the fact that he's 50 years old and, and the difficulty of the surgery um, is so favorable that you decide to maybe do something you wouldn't usually do. Um, of course, you can look at things like the, the uh, tumor genomics, um, you know, poor prognosis with, with the KRS mutation or, um, you know, how, how the patient has, um, has been approaching, you know, their, their um, disease process, et cetera. But I think, um, it's interesting to, to think of these patients, and there are some mostly retro, I think every study I've seen on this is retrospective, but there is data to show that in a very, very small subset of patients that um, um, kind of meet all the marks, they actually may have an acceptable um, long-term survival. I think I'd seen one study that 
eight percent five-year survival rate which is which is you know considering um that this is metastatic pancreatic cancer um in that small subset of patients it may be okay to consider uh disease and 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 this is almost was almost happened um, by mistake considering the patient needed the cholecystectomy for for the um uh obstructive uh, jaundice, essentially, obstructive hyperbilirubinemia caused by the sludge, um, and that at that same time, the resection of the um, easily accessible pancreatic uh, liver lesion was done. So um, definitely not a typical case, but but interesting to think when you can apply the, the same individualized practice, you know, for, for a good outcome. I had a question. I had a, I had a, qu a quick question. I maybe I missed it in the beginning, but we went for cholecystectomy for sludge rather than an ERCP and a stent placement, maybe uh, avoiding an operation. What was the the real way we could have, uh, you know, biopsy even with an EUS, the, the liver lesion that was very accessible. What was the real reason to do? Because I agree with Rohan about metastatic disease, metastatic disease. Why don't we treat it as a metastatic disease and sit, then see the response? Why, uh, and I understand he's young and all, oh, trust me, anybody younger than me is a baby. So, and he reached that point. So, you know, I, I'm all for being aggressive. It's just, what was the, the thought process on taking the gallbladder and doing the, the resection rather than the biopsy uh, for that particular, uh, and I apologize if that was described. No, I, I think the I think the reasoning behind it was was basically that um, of course you know the the um, obstructive uh, sludge could have been dealt with with a with a biliary stent, um, but I think the thought process was also that in if there weren't the metastatic lesion or the presumed metastatic lesion, um, a cholecystectomy would have been sufficient, which is obviously a, in some ways a better long term. Um, uh, long-term option for a patient that may be alive for you know multiple months or even years and doesn't have an obstructing lesion. It's not like something that, that's going to continue to grow. And so I think the the thought process was that the cholecystectomy would deal with the issue, um, and that at the same time, uh, essentially an excisional biopsy could also solve the question of whether or not that was a metastatic lesion. Um, you know, at the same time. But I definitely agree. You know, I I, I absolutely understand your your reasoning that. You know, at the same time, you could just back away completely and say, you know, deal with this non-operatively as much as possible. But, but you know, I think in this case, it actually gives you a little bit of a better snapshot of this patient's tumor biology because while they've been getting their neoadjuvant therapy, they haven't blossomed any other lesions. And so, you know, I would get a PET scan of this patient, but everything. So in a six to at least a six month time period, there's no new lesions. CA199 is completely normal. The primary tumor has shrunk and, and may have less pedividity, if any, of all. So this may be the patient to push the envelope on. Yes. So um, in the interest of time, I do want to give Dr. Kunzler uh, an opportunity to finish his presentation. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to him. Okay, so just, um, so we discussed the, this case in tumor board uh, and uh, resection was advised. So we took him to an extended distal pancreatectomy, did fine postoperatively, and we saw near complete response also with no perineural invasion, no perivascular invasion. His CA199 after uh, one month of surgery was seven, zero lymph nodes positive out of 36. Okay. So, <laughs> how long ago was the case, if I could just ask? Because I know somebody is going to ask that. Yeah. And what is the current status of the patient? The patient, so this surgery was in July. That's why I cannot give you long, longer term for follow-up. That's the only CA99 I have. Okay. And we don't have new imaging yet, but he's doing he's doing fantastic. Okay. The surgery, I don't I don't know the exact time, but I think it took us around how many, uh, Dr. Osman? Like um, three, five, <laughs> six hours. No, I think it took about three hours. Three hours. <laughs> it was extended distal. Yeah, yeah we, we just part of anesthesia the, um, and everything. Right. So my, my only question was not how long the operation took, but how, mm -hmm. how long a follow-up that you have. So why don't you continue with your presentation? Yes, we have two, two, two months and I have follow-up basically. Okay, then I'm going to show um, some, uh, I'll be brief in showing the, the clinical trials we have in new adjuvant chemotherapy. I'll start with uh, this one. This is actual meta-analysis from 2010, just to show what was our... Uh, 
picture in, in the 2010. Um, so this meta-analysis combined 111 studies and you see that um, there were many different uh, chemotherapy types. So this was before fulfirinox. And the results as expected um, for resectable cases, um, whether they go resection and then adjuvant therapy or they go new adjuvant and resection, the overall, um, the medium survival is basically the same, which doesn't differ much from the locally advanced unresectable group that undergoes new adjuvant and resection also. Um, well, then I'll, I'll brush some of the most important clinical trials um, that there are on this topic. So this clinical trial from Jang uh, was designed to roll 110 patients and they did it from 2012 and 2014. The first arm did surgery first. The second arm did chemo, chemo radiation. Chemo radiation was uh, combined with gemcitabine. Both arms uh, actually did radiation. Um, so the surgery uh, first group did radiation and gemcitabine after the surgery. Um, it's interesting, this is the first trial um, to show survival benefit with new adjuvant chemo radiation therapies. And the study actually had to be stopped by the safety committee when they had accrued 28 uh, and 30 patients because of safety reasons. So this is the intention to treat analysis showing 20, 24% uh, three-year survival in the, um, the new adjuvant group and around like 8% survival in the, in the surgery first group. This is a second um, clinical trial I'll show. And just to, to include uh, one trial that has uh, combination chemotherapy. So this trial from Rennie includes 93 patients from 2010, 2015, and had three arms. One arm surgery first, followed by gemcitabine, second arm surgery, followed by gemcitabine, plac paclitaxel, cisplatin, and epirubicin, and a third arm, which was the new adjuvant uh, arm, which received the same regimen as the, the second arm, but as new adjuvant chemotherapy, divided in new adjuvant and adjuvant. And this, this, um, this trial showed that the, the third arm, the new adjuvant arm, did much better in the five-year um, survival, overall survival, than the other arms that had surgery first. And then I'll go to the Priopank pre pre uh, trial, which everybody knows. Um, um, this trial included 248 patients from 2013 to 2017. Um, they excluded uh, uh, patients with tumors that they're less than two centimeters and and they had no vascular involvement. There were two arms. So the first arm is the new adjuvant arm. The second arm is the surgery first arm. The chemotherapeutic agent was monotherapy with gencitabine, and radiation was 36 uh, gray. And all of them uh, received adjuvant therapy. Hmm. And if you see their survival curve, so the survival cur curve on the left compares irrespective of resectability. So um, upfront surgery is the one on the bottom did much worse than the new adjuvant uh, uh, therapy group, which had almost like 25% survival in five years. And the graph on the right stratifies by resectability. So um, basically the new adjuvant group are the two on top. So resectable first, borderline resectable after, and then the upfront resection group are the ones in the bottom, also doing worse. Um, there were other uh, clinical uh, trials that were uh, either did not show survival benefit. Um, I'll not, I'm not going to go through them, but they are included in this meta-analysis. So we'll kind of um, uh, mention them here. So this is a meta-analysis that include, include basically uh, seven trials. Um, the ones I showed you from, from Verstegen, uh, from Jang, and from Rennie, and two other ones, Casaday from 2015, which showed no, no survival benefit, as you see, and Gosher 2015 that showed no survival benefit, and two other abstracts. So one from UNO. So this, um, this two used uh, uh, capecitabine, and one from UNO. 
Uno used uh, capecitabine and S1 in the in the um, new adjuvant group, and upfront surgery on the second one, and the one from wait my mouse this oh, sorry let me go back, and the one from Garnier, which included one arm with fulfirinox, one arm with uh, gemcitabine abraxane, and one arm with uh, a chemo radiation with um, capecitabine only. So if you pull the results for the resectable um, uh, patients, uh, there is no statistic. There is a trend in in favoring uh, new adjuvant treatment first, but there is no um, no statistical significance. Now for the borderline resectable, it's very clear that new adjuvant treatment um, favors um, improves overall survival. If we go to the overall survival from chemotherapy and chemo radiation. So both regimens, they do better than, than upfront surgery, pulling the, the data. Uh, I'm gonna go to conclusions now, Dr. Agopin, do you want to, to pause now or can I conclude? Uh, no, I think I think we have five more minutes left. Um, why don't you, why don't you um, conclude and ask the questions that you you wanted to ask? Okay, so my, uh, the conclusion is this, is new adjuvant chemotherapy beneficial for pancreatic cancer? And the way we answer this is that um, many of the patients, they likely have micrometastatic disease by the time they're diagnosed. And chemotherapy is a way for us to, um, to start fighting this disease because we're not fighting the disease locally. It's, it's clearly not enough for pancreatic cancer. We have to fight the, the distant disease. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to see the, the biology of the disease, to see if the disease is going to be responsive to chemotherapy and to see if new metastatic lesions are going to appear in the meantime, rendering the surgery um, uh, useless. Uh, it also downstages the, the lesions. So many of the patients we saw today had big lesions, three, four centimeter lesions that came down to two centimeter lesions. And another important thing is that um, many of the surgical patients, uh, so WIPO procedures are very morbid procedures. So many of the patients that undergo WIPOs, they don't have, uh, they are not ready, they have complications, they're not ready to receive chemotherapy in a window in a time frame that's going to help them. So that's the other point uh, that I think uh, makes us. Um, Try and do new adjuvant more than upfront resection. Um, then that's my last slide. Thank you everybody for for the very interesting, very interesting uh, conversation. I learned a lot. Tonight. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, um, Dr. Kunzler, for putting together three fantastic cases for discussion and um, stimulating the discussion amongst the participants. Um, uh, I'd like to open it up if anyone has any um, further questions or points that they would like to make. I, I, I guess I put it in my chat, but I'm just amazed at the fact that we are so happy with lack of response because I don't know any of the tumor site that I treat that where thrilled with a lack of response. Um, so I, I, I just put that out there because, you know, as you all know, there was a really fantastic debate at the HBBA between uh, two giants, uh, you know, from Europe and from the US on neoadjuvant in resectable. I think borderline resectable is clearly, I mean, we all agree that we need to do that. But then we also have this great debate about what is resectable, right? If you talk to the Mayo folks, nothing is unresectable. I mean, for me, anything that's touching the vein is borderline resectable. But if in a clearly resectable lesion like the one you showed, um, Dr. Kunzler, that that body lesion that was clearly resectable, you know, the question is, would you have just proceeded with distal pancreatectomy or do you routinely treat everyone who's clearly resectable, forget the MET with chemotherapy? Would that be your takeaway from this? For, for adenocarcinoma, uh, Dr. Jairaja, yes. I think I, I would tend to do new adjuvin. Okay. And you're convinced by the data that that's, that's beneficial? 
or does it just sort out the the, the bad actors? Yeah, it's hard because um, the pool, you see the pool data for upfront recyclable is not, you see there's a tendency, but there's no statistical significance, significance right? Right, right. So, the, uh, 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 the other question I just wanted to ask the group is what are we calling R1, right? Because in the UK and in, and in Europe, uh, you know, greater than one millimeter is considered R1, whereas in the US we treat one, mil, uh, you know, on ink as R1. Uh, Dr. Uh, Berman, what do you all call R1 at your institution? We typically will go with the one millimeter uh, okay. cut off. And, and that's interesting because I think most US uh, institutions would use um, uh, tumor on ink. The other part is if you look at the European data, they're actually really thrilled with an R1 rate of 70% because there are not do better right? because they're actually to our north. Uh, Dr. Sekandi, what do you all use at your institution? Is it greater than one or on ink? So basically R0 means that no tumor on ink. So we use, we use the American way. Yeah. So it's just interesting because in the US, we really consider ourselves very you know, we, we, we sort of measure ourselves by the R0 rate, whereas in the UK, they actually measure themselves by the R1 rate, because that's the pathologist. So, sorry, Dr. Hagopian, I talked a lot, but I think- No, Dr. it's been. wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. J. Raj. Dr. H. Asban has a comment. Yeah, very quickly. I mean, you know, we talk so much about R0 and R1, and the reality is, how are we measuring pathology, right? If you go to Verbecki and you do the actual cuts that they don't do even frozen, then your R1 rate goes to 70 to 80%. And uh, a lot of Europeans follow that. And we just keep calling, you know, R0, R1. I think that the most important reason to me to do neoadjuvant therapy is because we see on the last several decades, we haven't impinged at all what's the overall prognosis on pancreatic cancer. And now we finally have two regimes that appear in the adjuvant setting that there is enough to say that they help then we need to believe that by the time we do surgery on these patients, these patients have generalized disease because they die from metastatic disease. Then I do think that we all should be a little bit more patient to accumulate more years to be able to have more data to see if really neoadjuvant therapy helps or it doesn't. What it is clear is appears to be no inferiority. And I think that it's about time that we try something different because with surgery, we will not improve prognosis. Yeah. Without trying um, things that are different, we never make progress. That's actually one of the most important lessons that I that I had when I did my my surgical fellowship in France. So um, it, it it's past the hour, and so I just want to give a big round of applause for uh, Dr. Kunzler. Really fantastic talk. Really appreciate it, and thank you so much everyone for your participation. And thank you so much, Dr. Benzi and Dr. J. Raja for the kind invitation for me to participate. This has been very, really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gopian. We love having you. Look forward to next time as well. And everyone else here on the call, thank you so much um, for being here tonight. I put in the next uh, topic will be um, hernia repair and cirrhotics, always a fan favorite on November 14th. So please keep your calendars open and uh, look forward to seeing you then. Have a good Thank you. And again, congratulations to Rohan, uh, Dr. Hagopian, and uh, Dr. Benzi.